first of all, welcome. Uh, we haven't met in a few weeks, so welcome back. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. And I'm thrilled to be with you uh, at this uh, first session of our new virtual regroup on the life of the mind. Um, I say welcome back. We haven't met in a month. Uh, it's great to see you. I was just at uh, the opera at Bard College, uh, um, King Arthur. And when the announcement came on and we had a full house and it said, welcome back, the crowd erupted into applause. And uh, it does remind us about the beauty of being together uh, in this case, and in, in that case, in, in, in person at the Opera House. But it's nice to be back with you again. So welcome back. Um, uh, we are hoping to welcome you back in person at our annual conference coming up in October. And I hope some of you can make that. Um, before we, we actually dive into the text, The Life of the Mind, I have one or two announcements. Um, first of all, uh, um, as, as many of you have, have noticed, um, uh, our former uh, assistant director of the center, who's been a great part of the center for the last six years, Samantha Hill, has, has not been around much and she has left and we wish her well. I think she's in Greece working on some new projects. Uh, her new book, her new biography of Hannah Arendt is coming out as we speak. And uh, if you became a member of the center, you get a nice discount for that. So I hope you make use of that. But the good news, in addition to that, that I have is that we have a new assistant director of the Hannah Arendt Center, uh, Tara Needham, who many of you know, because she's been uh, uh, an active member of the center for the last year or two since the pandemic started, I believe. And um, I'm thrilled to have her here and I thought just because she's going to be on and sometimes she'll be uh, contributing and, and, and hope at some point leading this group, I wanted to introduce herself so you all know who she is. So welcome, Tara. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Roger. And hello, everybody, my fellow VRG members. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be starting um, as the Assistant Academic Director. And a little bit about me, some of you already know. Um, I'm, I have an academic background and in particular um, over 15 years of teaching experience and I'm a PhD candidate and I focus on political violence and imperialism as studied through the novels of the early 20th century. But my broader questions are largely about uh, questions of violence, civil disobedience, political change and Arendt has been a very important thinker for me um, for the last almost 20 years. Uh, in addition to that, I also have um, a sort of second trajectory as a nonprofit arts administrator with um, a commitment to the public humanities. So the uh, Arendt Center has merged both of these paths for me. And I just want to say to all of you that participating in this group has been so inspiring and um, really, really uh, pushed me to want to, to serve this group more and serve the organization. And so I, I'm so looking forward to continuing the conversation with you all in this capacity and in other capacities. So thank you, Roger. No, oh, yeah, welcome and thank you, Tara. It's really, uh, we're really looking forward to, to working with you. Tara actually doesn't start until I think next, in two weeks officially, but she's here on board and in my office up at BART. So uh, yeah, I'm welcome. impersonating Roger with the book. You. We love uh, that. Here. <laughs> so, um, so welcome to you. Uh, one other quick announcement. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the benefits of being a VRG member, which we've uh, really enjoyed, um, and I think many of you have made use of over the last year or so since we started it, are these um, dialogue groups that we've created and that the and one of our v, another one of our VRG members actually uh, instituted and has helped run that's Susan Oberman. And I uh, thought I'd give her since we're starting a new book, I'd give Susan um, uh, a short time to just introduce how, what these dialogue groups are and, and how you can join one if you'd like Susan. Hi everybody. Um, so we started in uh, February, I think it was, and some of those groups are still going. Some have disbanded. They aren't really necessarily connected to whatever book we're reading, but for many of us, having a place to talk more in more depth, to express a lot of what uh, we don't get a chance to say in VRG is, is the purpose of the groups. And so you can sign up. I put the... Um, a link in the chat. You can sign up 
uh, on the registration form on the website, and then I will get in touch with you and um, hopefully we'll have some new groups starting as we start Life of the Mind. Um, so that's that's it. Uh, wonderful. Um, I'm going to change my background because some of you are not happy with my background. Um, there you go. I see that in the chat. Um, Susan, can you put it in the chat again so that people who come in later can see it as well because you can't see it earlier? Sure. Um, so great. Uh, so now let's, uh, I hope you do join those dialogue groups that people who've been in them have, have found them to be incredibly uh, uh, helpful. And uh, I think they're an excellent supplement to what we're doing here. So um, we actually read uh, part one of The Life of the Mind, I think about two and a half, three years ago in this group. Um, and um, I think it was an incredibly exciting experience. Many of us really like this book. It's, 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 it's a strange book in the Hannah Arendt corpus uh, for a few reasons. Um, one, uh, it's her only book of what she would call philosophy. I mean, you, you, when, you, when you encounter Hannah Arendt uh, in the world, um, she's often described as a philosopher. Uh, but for those of you who know, and when we've read, uh, her, her, or read the transcript of her Gunter Gauss interview, and she says, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, in that one, she says, I'm a thinker or a political theorist. Um, and so this is her only explicit attempt to sort of cross over from political thinking into philosophy. Uh, and she begins with, with this question, so we'll come back to it in a second. It's also um, her last book, but also an unfinished book. Um, you know, there's, there's some famous stories about it, but basically she gave part one, which is thinking, um, as, as a series of Gifford lectures at, at Stanford University. Uh, uh, and then um, she um, uh, had finished the, a draft of part two on willing, and then had the title page of, uh, with some epigraphs of part three on judgment or judging in her typewriter when she died uh, suddenly from a heart attack. Um, so uh, it's an unfinished book. The, the actual notes were fair, the, the manuscript was, was not finished, even for part one and two, two. And her close friend and literary executor, the person who probably knew her work best, Mary McCarthy, um, edited the book and edited it fairly extensively uh, to try and make it uh, understandable. Um, as part of the new Hannah Arendt critical edition, uh, which has been coming out in parts and which is truly uh, an amazing endeavor, um, led in part by my friend and Arendt Center colleague, Thomas Wild, um, uh, there's a new edition of The Life of the Mind, which is in preparation and should be out within a year or two, maybe a year and a half, um, edited by Thomas Barcher and Wout Kernelison. And it's going to restore and highlight the differences between Mary, the original edition and Mary McCarthy's edition. It's gonna make, I think from what I've seen of parts of it, it's gonna really raise some important questions of the differences and, and, and ways in which McCarthy understood the RN. We're not gonna focus on that. We're gonna read the text that we have, which is the Mary McCarthy edited version. But in a number of uh, our sessions, we're gonna be joined by Thomas Barcher, who's one of the editors of this new edition and um, he'll be able to uh, give us some insight into some of the changes that have been made. Uh, he'll be with us next week for sure um, and you know over the course of our reading he'll be there for some of the sessions when he's available. So I'm excited about that. Uh, so again we, we're going to read the text as we have it. Uh, I, I don't think I think that's fine. I think it's a it's a text that's worth reading very much, much worth reading. And I look forward to, to reading it with you um, as we go along. So um, just as by way of introduction, uh, she begins by saying that she's not a professional philosopher, as we've as I've already said, um, and yet she's going to engage in this text about 
uh, the life of the mind. Um, what does it mean for her to say that she's not a professional philosopher? Some people think it's sort of a feint. Uh, others think, well, what is she, you know, I mean, she is, she's clearly, a, she's trained by Heidegger and Jaspers. What would it mean to say she's not a philosopher? I think it means um, primarily uh, one thing. She's not, uh, she's not a professional philosopher in the sense that she's not concerned with the discipline of philosophy. She's not concerned in telling the story of philosophy and saying, you know, I have to cite Plato and, and, and Democritus and Aristotle and whatever, and I, have to, and I have to tell a story that's a disciplinary story as Heidegger would tell it about the history of being, right? Heidegger tells the story of philosophy as a story of the history of, of being. Arendt is not interested in that. She's not interested in the concepts. She's not interested in the way one philosopher leads to another philosopher leads to another philosopher leads to another philosopher. She's interested in the way that philosophers on their own, reading them, make us see the world and think about the world. Um, and so she doesn't come at it with this professional interest. She comes at it with what we might call a humanist interest, uh, an interest in understanding uh, our world and, and reading philosophy uh, through that. Um, and so that's what she means on, on one level, uh, uh, that she, when she says that she's not a philosopher. Um, but she says she nevertheless has been uh, inspired to write this book on thinking, on the mental activity of thinking. And she says there are two things that inspired her to do so, um, both related to two earlier books that she wrote. Uh, the first that she mentions, which is the latter historically, is her book Eichmann in Jerusalem and her encounter with Adolf Eichmann at the trial in Jerusalem, where, as she says, the fact of Eichmann's banality um, and the banality of evil struck her. Um, you know, this question of the banality of evil is, is obviously one uh, that has been uh, debated and to death, maybe. Uh, but Arendt here um, characterizes it as she does in many of her attempts to uh, make sense of the controversy as a fact. Um, as she says, Factually, my preoccupation with the mental activities has two different origins, and one from the fact of the banality of evil, that she saw in Eichmann somebody who um, was really simply banal, um, that he didn't have uh, these great, you know, um, uh, evil, demonic uh, aspects to him, and that while he uh, at times, you know, could be anti-Semitic or could be, you know, could represent a Nazi view. What she says is that his behavior during the trial um, was, was really characterized um, uh, by a kind of thoughtlessness. Uh, it was not stupidity, but thoughtlessness, as she writes on page four. And she says, in the setting of Israeli court and the prison procedures, he functioned as well as he had functioned in the Nazi regime. As long as he had bureaucratic procedures, as long as he had um, cliches and, and, and guideposts, he was fine and he was actually a very smart and competent bureaucrat. But it's as soon as he lost that, as soon as he had to think on himself, for himself, without cliches or stock phrases or standardized codes, that's when he um, was lost. And uh, he differed from the rest of us, she says, in that he knew no such claim of thinking. And by thinking, she means attention to the events and facts of the world uh, that we notice by virtue of their existence. He simply didn't attend to the world, didn't attend to the facts. He hid from reality behind cliches, conventions, codes, expressions. And so he didn't think. And this lack of thinking, this thoughtlessness, this absence of thinking, she says, um, is really what struck her about Eichmann. 
And so she comes to frame this question for herself um, over the next few, uh, next decade, really, uh, in which she asks the question and she puts it in page five here at the beginning of the first full paragraph on page five. Could the activity of thinking as such, the habit of examining whatever happens to come to pass or to attack, attract attention, regardless of results and specific content, could this activity be among the conditions that make men abstain from evil doing or even actually condition them against it? So can this activity of thinking which she calls a habit, right? Not unimportantly, because she's going to, remember thinking she's going to say comes from, is gonna be like a habit, a habit of examining whatever comes to pass or attract attention regardless of the results. Thinking is a habit of being struck. It's a habit of wondering. It's a habit of what she will call stopping and thinking. It's a habit of being pulled out of the everyday, out of the movement of occurrences, out of the happenings of events, and stopping and thinking and attending to um, those things in the world. And she asks, can this habit of thinking uh, be among the things that make men abstain from doing evil? And so that's one of the reasons she turns to this question of thinking uh, and philosophy uh, in her book. Um, the second reason, uh, she'll say, uh, is, that, is, is that she also wrote a book, which we just finished reading, The Human Condition, which she says was a title her publisher smartly gave to the book, but that she had called the Vita Activa, concerned with the problem of the life of action. Um, and the Vita Activa, the life of action, was, was, was counter to the life of the mind. And so here you see where the title Life of the Mind comes from. It's the other side of the Vita Activa, the life of action. And um, in the Vita Activa, or the human condition, as you know, she looked at the um, change in hierarchy um, first between the Vita Contempliva and the Vita Activa, which is that for um, the, the Greek philosophers and prior to that, the life of the mind, the Vita Contempliva was higher than the Vita Activa. And she says that that's changed, that we've had an inversion. And that secondly, there's then been a second inversion in the Vita Activa itself, so that the um, uh, lowest form of the Vita Activa, the, the, uh, that namely of labor, has become the highest and the highest, the life of action has become uh, subsumed under the anima laborans or the life of labor. And so um, the Vita Activa, that, for, that book she wrote, in many ways is concerned with the, the loss of the life of the mind, the Vita Contempliva. And yet she says she's always been bothered by this quote from Cato, which she ends the book, The Human Condition with, never is a man more active than when he does nothing. Never is he less alone than when he is by himself. And she says this quote of, of Cato's cited by Cicero um, gives rise to her doubts about the strong distinction between the life of the mind and the life of action. It gives rise to doubts about the passivity of the Vita Contempliva or the life of the mind. And so it raises the question of, if the first, if the Eichmann book raises the question of, could the activity, and here the word activity of thinking, be what prevents us from doing evil? The second doubt is, is thinking not passive as it's been seen in the tradition, but active itself? And thus, this raises the question, what are we doing? What is our activity when we do nothing but think? Is thinking not simply passivity or meditation, but a kind of action? And then that also raises the question of where are we when we are together with no one but ourselves? And so these are the, the background 
questions that she says um, have spurred her to write this book on thinking when she doesn't think of herself as a philosopher, as someone who, who spends her time thinking about thinking. She spends her time for the most part in her life thinking about action um, and acting. And yet now she wants to ask about the activity of thinking. To what extent is thinking itself an activity that can matter in the world? And in many ways, that is the question of this book. That may be seen as maybe the first introduction of this introduction. The second introduction, um, which is a more substantive introduction and begins us into uh, the actual substantive um, uh, thesis of the book, um, goes from page pages uh, eight until the end of the introduction on page 16. And, and here, what she does is um, raise the question again, what are we doing when we think? What is thinking? And she says that the question of thinking um, begins with metaphysics. It begins with the gap between um, the words and language with which we think and describe the world and the world of appearances itself, the world we see. It begins with the gap between um, the super sensible, what we think and put in language but don't sense, and the sensible, that which we actually perceive or sense in the world. Um, and, and, and most of philosophy from Plato and Aristotle up through the uh, 18th or 19th centuries is largely a philosophy of metaphysics. Uh, a philosophy of um, that which comes after the physical world, metaphysica, ta metaphysica, what is what it comes after, and that's usually seen as the invisible, the uh, the linguistic, the super sensible, the ideas, idealism. Um, and so we've had through the history of philosophy. If you're a philosopher and trained in the discipline of philosophy, you have the basic metaphysical distinction between uh, what is and what ought to be. Um, and another way of putting it is between being and appearance. And appearance is sort of what is, but is in a deceptive way. And being is what is true because it's ideal and true not only in uh, deceptive appearance, but in the truth in some metaphysical sense. And for Arendt, um, the basic fact of the modern age uh, is that we have uh, lived through what is called the death of metaphysics or the death of God, um, which mean really the same thing. We're not talking about a religious thesis. We're talking about a philosophical thesis. The, the basic idea uh, is that uh, the death of God and the death of metaphysics means that we no longer believe in the hierarchy of the ideals that are truer than and more lasting than the real. We no longer believe even in the separation between an ideal world and a real world. We no longer say that there's this top to my drink and then there's this idea of all tops or covers and that this is simply a, a copy or a manifestation of it. We don't believe that there's a truer, higher world. Um, and, and this has been seen by some people as dangerous. Uh, the danger that they see in it is nihilism, right? That we no longer have the highest ideals. Um, uh, other people see it as an opportunity. Well, we no longer have the highest ideals. Now we have to build our world without listening to these ideals. We have to build it imminently from the ground up. Uh, and that is how Arendt generally sees this problem. She's someone who fundamentally believes in the death of metaphysics, in the death of God. Uh, she fundamentally believes that there's no going back and we shouldn't want to go back to uh, a, a time of metaphysical truths, of super sensible truths. Um, and she says that there's different aspects of this end of metaphysics. Politically, um, the end of metaphysics uh, is consonant with what she calls the death of authority or the loss of authority. 
And um, we've read about that in her book, Between Past and Future, in the essay, What is Authority? Which begins, well, this essay should actually be called What Was Authority? Because authority no longer is. And, and her argument in, uh, what is, in What is Authority is that the loss of authority is a political crisis, but also a political opportunity because it allows us to build the world anew. It gives us that freedom to no longer be stuck in a tradition of metaphysics, but to actually build the world anew. It's dangerous, but there's an opportunity. Similarly, here in the life of the mind, she says, we're not gonna focus on that political aspect of the death of metaphysics, namely the loss of political authority, um, but we're gonna focus instead on what does the end of metaphysics mean for our thinking ability? And uh, she says there are two, um, well, well, she says, first of all, let's understand that the death of metaphysics doesn't mean the death of thinking. We can still think, we can still conceptualize things beyond the, the, the real or the apparent world. Um, and yet she says there's actually two advantages to the death of metaphysics. And they're similar somewhat to the advantages she talked about in the political structure in the essay, What is Authority? The first advantage, she says, is that because of the death of, uh, uh, the death of metaphysics, we can actually look at the world anew. This is on page 12. Um, so she says, hence the possible advantage, this is the first full paragraph on page 12, hence the possible advantage of our situation following the demise of metaphysics and philosophy would be twofold. First, it would permit us to look at the past on the past with new eyes unburdened and unguided by any traditions, and thus to dispose of a tremendous wealth of raw experiences without being bound by any prescriptions as to how to deal with these treasures. And then she quotes René Char, our inheritance comes to us by no will and testament. So the first advantage is that we can, we can, we, we can look at the world anew. We can look at all the experiences today and begin to think them. And we don't have to think them like Plato thought them or like the Christians thought them or like the idealist philosophers thought them or like the Western tradition thought them. We can think about them from a global tradition. We can think about them anew in a pluralist way. And, um, and that's an enormous advantage uh, for her. The second advantage um, is that because metaphysics is dead and thus philosophy as a discipline is dead, um, and because we're thinking about the world, not in a tradition of philosophy and the jargon of philosophy, it's no longer uh, an activity that is to be limited to experts. It's no longer a professional, a professional activity uh, for philosophers. It's open to everybody. So she says this on the middle of page 13, the next page. So she'll say, um, if, as I have suggested before, the ability to tell right from wrong should turn out to have anything to do with the ability to think, then we must be able to demand its exercise from every sane person no matter how erudite or ignorant, intelligent or stupid he may happen to be. And so this is the, the second advantages of thinking in the age of the death or the end of metaphysics. And here's the third part of the introduction. It's the first part is for two impetus, right? The, the Eichmann book and thus um, the question of can thinking prevent evil, the human condition, uh, and Vita Activa book, and the question of um, uh, rethinking the life of the mind as an activity, not as a passivity. The second uh, being this question of the death of metaphysics and the advantages that the death of metaphysics offers us, namely uh, that we think anew and that everybody can do it. And now here we get to the uh, truly substantive element and okay, she turns to Kant, a, a philosopher, but a philosopher who for her is maybe the one philosopher of all philosophers who thinks um, uh, freely in this way. And what she says is that Kant understood thinking um, as split into two parts, between thinking and knowing. Um, 
he makes a distinction between the word verstand, which is related to our word understand, uh, which is like understanding the truth of something, the intellect that knows things and thus leads to cognitive knowledge or knowing. That's verstand on the one hand. And against verstand, Kant offers the idea of vernunft or reason, which doesn't seek truth, but seeks meaning and doesn't seek knowing, but seeks to think or thinking. And this distinction between knowing and thinking, between truth and meaning, between Verstand and Vernunft is the, is the thesis of this whole book. This is the key to the book that you need to keep in mind as you read this, at least the section on thinking. Um, so the next, uh, uh, 200 pages. And it's going to be a very difficult, uh, it's going to be a very difficult endeavor simply because it's a difficult idea to get a hold of. What is the difference between truth and meaning? If you can, if after we read this book, or at least this first section on thinking, you can really have a sense of that. This is probably, I, I've said a lot, I think in the last year on the reading group, for those of you who've been with us, you've heard me say, that what Arendt's really about is asking after what it means to live a meaningful life, right? I've said that a lot in our reading of the human condition and I think some of the other texts. And I take that largely from this book. Uh, it's everywhere in Arendt once you read it here, but it's in this book that Arendt more than anywhere else formulates what I think is a driving maybe the driving um, uh, insight of all of her thinking, which is that to be human is to live meaningfully and not to live truthfully. That's the difference she's putting out there. And so if we can understand the difference between meaning and truth, we'll go a long way. So she says that Kant, Kant actually says that in order to, um, in order to have faith, you have to deny knowledge, right? This is one of his famous sentences that we have to move beyond simply cognition in order to open up the realm of thinking and faith or pure reason. And she says that Kant, this is on page 15, Kant did not attend to thinking himself because to some extent it was a mix of Vernunft and Verstand. And still for Kant even, thinking demanded the kind of certainty and evidence that for Arendt are the results of cognition. And so here's where Arendt is moving. I don't want to say moving beyond Kant because that's ridiculous and uh, arrogant, but she's saying that Kant, while he made this distinction between thinking and knowing, he still combined them in a certain way. And yet Arendt's going to ask, but if thinking and Vernunft, thinking uh, and uh, thinking as Vernunft are justified as being different from knowing in transcending the limits of cognition, um, then there must be the assumption, we must be able to make the assumption that thinking and reason are not concerned with what the intellect is concerned with. And this is the question she's posing for herself. Is there a way we can say that thinking is concerned with an activity, not of cognition, not of knowledge, not of truth, but of meaning. And thus, um, she says on page 15, which to me is the first time she's going to say it in the book. And to me, it, this is the, the key formulation uh, of this book. She'll say in, in, its, in italics, the need of reason, we can also say the need of thinking, is not inspired by the quest for truth, but by the quest for meaning. And truth and meaning are not the same. And so that's what we're going to be exploring uh, in this next 200 pages uh, as we read this question on thinking again. What is it that distinguishes meaning from truth, truth from meaning, and how can we think our meaning and the meaning of life? And how is that related to the life of the mind? Okay, I'm going to stop there with the introduction.
uh, and uh, open it up for our discussion. Uh, for those of you who know well uh, and been here, you've already started doing it. There's two ways to participate in the discussion. One is in the chat, uh, and you'll see already the chat has been quite active. And uh, I ask you in the chat to be um, respectful and cordial and listen to each other and engage each other's ideas and not the person. Um, also, uh, if we speak, the other way is to raise your hand and people are already raising their hands. Uh, I will call on you in the order of your hands raised. Um, if there is uh, an urgent need to intervene, you can ask to intervene and I'll, I'll decide at that point. Um, but generally we try and go in the order of, of the hands. Um, and I ask you to keep your questions respectful to everybody and brief. And uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, first question goes to Stephen. Stephen, you have to unmute yourself. Can you unmute? Yeah, go ahead. Nope. All right. Uh, Stephen, while you're unmuting, I'll ask David to ask his question. David, you have to unmute yourself too. Oh, Stephen, you're unmuted now. Stephen, go for it. You're okay. Up. Thank you. Good to see you, Roger, and everyone else. And thank you, Roger, for your kind comments on that that thing I sent you a few weeks ago, and also to Susan Oberman and Steve Greenleaf, who also were gifted with a, with a copy of it. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, Roger, I just have one preliminary question about the epigraph, uh, the Heidegger remarks at the beginning of, of this. Uh, how much weight should we put on those? When I looked at them just flat on the page about the four things that thinking does not do, it seemed like thinking was almost ruled out of the court in a way, what's the value of it then? If it doesn't bring knowledge, it doesn't produce usable practical wisdom, it doesn't solve the riddles of the universe, it doesn't endow us with the power to act. Uh, how how uh, generous an interpretation should we put on that? And in a comic vein, I thought, well, why don't we just substitute a couple of other words? Uh, fishing doesn't do any of those things, nor does sleeping. Does that make thinking sort of equivalent to those two activities. I'm sure nobody meant that, but when you see it flat on the page like that, it seems like thinking is, is quite an unusual being, and maybe that's what's intended by both Heidegger and, and Arendt. Uh, just a thought. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, so uh, as, as many of you know, um, Arendt uh, was a student of Heidegger's, um, you know, uh, also had a, a, a very close relationship with him, including being a lover of his for a couple of years, um, and um, was a, a, a deep and, and, and very uh, uh, insightful reader of his work. Um, she disagrees in the end with a lot of Heidegger. She has a lot of problems with Heidegger, uh, uh, both politically, personally, and intellectually. Um, and Perhaps the one area of Heidegger's thinking or writing that Arendt most deeply um, is influenced by, uh, which doesn't mean agrees with, but is engaged with, maybe is a better way to put it, is Heidegger's thinking about thinking. Um, uh, there's no doubt that um, the, the effort here to distinguish uh, thinking from knowing is indebted to Heidegger. Uh, there's also, um, to say that thinking is about meaning, um, the, the word, um, the, the typical, again, this is written in English um, and she never did translate this into German. Uh, this is something we can ask Thomas Barcher when he's here next week, um, to the extent we know what, what words Arendt would use for meaning here. Um, my, my best guess is that the word is Zinn, uh, S-I-N-N, -N, um, in German. 
um, uh, which means to sense, zin, or the sense of something. Um, and uh, Heidegger uh, writes a lot about zin. Uh, and so when Heidegger says these things uh, about thinking does not bring knowledge, does not produce usable wisdom, does not solve the riddles of the universe, does not endow us with the power to act, um, what he says is, a number of places, he says a couple of things, thinking, denken, ist dicht. Thinking is poeticizing, doing poetry. He'll say, denken ist zinnen. Denken is making sense, making meaning. Um, uh, these are attempts by Heidegger to think thinking um, uh, as an activity outside of um, uh, means and ends, outside of acting with effects, uh, and to try and think the thinker. Uh, and by the way, Heidegger also tries to get out of metaphysics and out of uh, the history of philosophy and move the thinker into this general sense of thinking as uh, an activity of, of making meaning in the world or making sense of the world. And so um, I think the, the choice of, of epigraphs um, is, is, is meaningful and, and, and important uh, that Arendt here, here uses. Um, I, I, I don't think you should imagine it uh, as simply her saying Heidegger, you know, I'm doing Heidegger. I don't think that's the case at all. She's going to distinguish herself from Heidegger. And as we get to the end of the book, uh, there'll be two or three chapters on Heidegger uh, in which we will engage with this much more directly. And uh, we'll have a chance to, 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 to talk about what Heidegger means and what Arendt means in distinction from Heidegger. Um, but uh, putting the Heidegger quote at the front as an epigraph, I think shows at least the way in which Heidegger is an inspiration for her attempt to explore the idea of thinking as a matter of making meaning rather than as an effort to find the truth. If that um, goes part of the way to answering your question. Yeah, that helps. I guess I think that finding meaning is is an instance of seeking and finding practical wisdom. So I, I don't get some of the distinction there, but I'll, I'll wait to see how the book pans out. Well, I mean, let's let's be clear. What he says is thinking does not does not produce usable practical wisdom. Um, it's not that thinking doesn't produce wisdom, but not it's not going to be wisdom in how to make a computer oh, or how oh, to, yeah. you know, uh, how to fight in an army. Um, it'll produce other things. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Yep. Uh, and we'll come back to Heidegger. Heidegger will be uh, talked about a lot in this book more than any other book she writes. So um, we'll have a chance to talk more about Heidegger as we go along. So actually, I had I had gone slightly out of order before. I hope this is not going to upset you, David. But your third, how is next? Yeah, Noah. Thank you very much. Yeah, Noah. My my question is uh, related to the uh, is related to basically one of the central premises of the book, which is uh, one of the things you were saying is that. Unlike before, whereas maybe in the days of uh, Plato, of course, is probably the most famous, oh, you have the idea of the cave, but the world of appearances isn't all what seems. Uh, in this kind of uh, post-war period, a lot of people are reflecting on this idea of what it, what it means to like, begin anew, like you, you start from a new place, and there's a, like, a certain responsibility associated with that, and uh, she condemns, of course, Eichmann for not holding that responsibility properly and uh, not thinking. I guess the question is, would she contend that before, I guess the quote unquote death of God or before these, uh, before the breakdown in tradition, was it easier to go about the world without committing atrocities, without thinking? And now there's a new responsibility to think because things like uh, those things are discredited in a certain way or nobody takes them seriously anymore. Yeah, I think that's right, and it's a good question. Um, you know, she she has a a brief line um, 
here on about habits and morals and habits. Um, where is that? Um, where she says that the origin of morality is in mores and habits. Um, uh, it's on page five, right? So it's actually in a, in a parenthetical phrase, uh, a third of the way down, where she says, the fact that we usually treat matters of good and evil in courses in morals or ethics may indicate how little we know about them. For morals come from mores and ethics from ethos, the Latin and the Greek word for customs and habit, the Latin word being associated with rules of behavior, whereas the Greek word is derived from habitat, like our habits. Um, the idea being here that um, to a large extent, uh, uh, whether we act in a good or evil way comes down to um, our knowledge of customs and habits. Um, uh, and, and Aristotle in, um, says, you know, the first thing that a good politician has to do is create laws that create good habits and good, good mores, because that's the way people obey laws, not because they follow moral propositions. Um, and so uh, to a large extent, we act morally or ethically because habits are strong and mores are strong. Um, we know how easy it is to um, uh, unlearn habits. Um, uh, and as she says right above what I just read, read on page five again, to be sure, not in the sense that thinking would ever be able to produce the good deed as its result, as though virtue could be taught and learned, so it's not that thinking can teach virtue, right? It's, virtue is not something you learn as a, as a proposition. She says only habits and customs can be taught. And we know only too well the alarming speed with which they are unlearned and forgotten when new circumstances demand a change in patterns, in patterns manners and patterns of behavior. Um, I mean, she, she writes in uh, the book, uh, 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 responsibility and judgment in one of the early essays. She says that um, between the last century of the 19th century and the and World War One, the entire habitual customary foundation of Western society fell apart. Um, and what you learned in that period was that you could change your morals and your habits with the speed that you could change like how, table manners. If the, if the customs and the habits break down, we lose those guideposts, those banisters that hold most people uh, together in an ethical community and acting ethically. And so this goes to your question, Hal, which is that for her, throughout history, and this is just for her an obvious, an obvious insight, most human beings are not going to be thoughtful most of the time. That's not, to, that's not a criticism, it's just a fact. Most of us have other concerns, whether it's economic concerns or we want to be with our family or whatever. Nobody can think all the time and very few of us can think a lot. And so um, for most of human history, to the extent one acts ethically or morally, one does so because one is habituated to do so and it's customary. Um, the breakdown of customs and habits uh, brings about moments of crisis. And um, if you are an Arendtian, which is a strange term, and I don't know if anyone really is, but let's say this, if you take Arendt seriously, um, you encounter someone who believes that somewhere around the turn of the, ninth, of the 20th century, around 1890 to 1910, 
the Western world experienced a fundamental break in its tradition, a break in customs and habits, such that the things that for centuries had been thought to be morally and habitually right, no longer were considered right or wrong. They were considered relative or optional. And that this breakdown in the tradition, which has its actual break in World War II and in the Holocaust and in totalitarianism, um, uh, has been has has left this world without the traditional guideposts or banisters that those traditions offer, and we are left adrift in a way. And the challenge of living in such a world um, is that either we have to create new traditions, in a sense, create new customs and new habits, or we have to learn to live without them at all. Um, Arendt, you know, has this, I think, somewhat uh, ideal or utopian side of her, which is like, we need to teach people to live in this gap, in this moment of openness without these traditions. Um, on the other hand, I think she also realizes that that's a dangerous situation. And I think her hope is that at some point, out of the living in that gap, new traditions will emerge. Uh, although uh, I, I don't know, um, she doesn't say that specifically in too many places. Um, in any case, you're right that it is in this gap, this gap of thinking, the gap between past and future, which she talks about in the book, Between Past and Future, um, in which we live without these guidelines and these habits and these morals and these customs uh, in which we have to think for ourselves. And so this book on the life of the mind is in many ways a, a book about how to think in that gap. And uh, in, uh, at the end of, well, in the, in, the, in the chapters, at the end of thinking on the gap between past and future, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll explore that explicitly and, uh, and we'll come back to that question. All right, Al? David. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, I guess the only the only kind of curveball I might throw out there is perhaps a medical metaphysical view of the world. And I'm not in favor of one, but I guess what would she or other people say to the idea that a metaphysical view of the world in the traditional platonic sense would get people to obsess over these questions more by definition in so far as like they'd be searching for the reality behind behind appearances. Whereas now we're left more in a world of appearances and less so in uh, kind of these abstractions. Well, that's a nice thought, but the metaphysical view of the world is gone. I mean, that's just, she takes that as a fact. Um, oh yeah, no, I totally agree. But I was just wondering if like, if that would be some sort of, uh, that would be like, on one hand, we need to think more. On the other hand, there's almost less of an incentive to think now because people no longer would be thinking in, would think they would have to answer those questions as much. Well, if, if, okay, I mean, what she's trying to say is we actually need more thinking now and by more people. We don't need thinking just by Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. We need thinking by a much wider range of people. And, uh, and that's the great opportunity that we can think the world anew and we can bring non-experts and new people into it. Um, you know, I think that's the, uh, I think it's one of the really exciting things about uh, her approach in this book. Uh, that it it really is a a book set against any kind of um, uh, sense of professional hierarchy in the world of thinking. Uh, David. Hi. Um, thanks very much for wonderful short um, focused introduction. Um, I had a number of thoughts um, and a question. The first of all, it seems to me extraordinary that Arendt should start off her journey with Eichmann. And I think this is an extraordinary creative act. That is, I, I think in some sense, all of us kind of know what thinking is, but we don't know how to talk about it. But 
we can start off by saying we know what it isn't. And that helps us think about what it might be. And here's a fantastic example of what it isn't. Um, and of course, um, I know there's, you'll know a lot more about this, but I know there's been a lot of argument about Eichmann and other things have been found that he wrote that said he, in fact, he was uh, passionate. He was full of, uh, he did have an ideology and so on. I don't think that matters in the slightest. She's, because uh, I think she's right about the idea. She may be wrong about the exemplar, but it doesn't weaken the idea, but I expect you, you're more up to date about that. But the, the, the other thing we know is it's not instrumental thinking. It's the opposite of instrumental thinking. So there's a lot of things of knowing what it isn't, but I also want to say you can't think unless you're in possession of your mind. And there are a number of ways in which we are not in possession of our minds. For example, if you're a member of a group and you idealize the leader, a very common phenomenon, then you lose possession of your own mind. Similarly, uh, very familiar to me as an analyst is the activity of projection. That if you project aspects of yourself into other people, for example, best example of course is, is, is racism, but there are many other examples. You denude your own mind. So you lose contact with your own mind. Therefore you cannot think. And so I think it's quite helpful to think about the various processes that rob one of the capacity to be in possession of one's own mind, as far as one can be. Of course, one never arrives there, but as far as one can be. And one can do that by looking at the examples of when one is not in possession of one's own mind. Thanks, David. Um, very insightful. Um, yeah, I, I think um, what are these what are these ways in which we rob ourselves of the ability to be in possession of our own mind? Um, and I think you tell me if I get you right when I hear you saying that rob us of the ability to be in possession of our own mind means to um, encounter reality um, uh, 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 ourselves and not through um, some other theory, whether it's racism or communism or um, environmentalism or whatever other theory it is, but encounter it um, uh, to the greatest extent we can um, uh, as ourselves uh, without some movement or theory or crutch uh, or, or metaphysical idea or, or tradition and, and just encountered as a thinking person. Um, whatever that thinking person is, and, and obviously, you know, there probably is no such, there is no such thing as a thinking person without being part of different uh, worlds or communities. Um, but, but I think that is uh, to some degree um, what Arendt is, is getting at and, and what she saw as uh, Eichmann's inability to do so because he hid reality behind cliches, stock phrases, adherence to conventional standardized codes of expression and conduct with socially recognized functions that protect us against reality. Um, it's that, and you know, in, in a lot of her essays that we've read recently, we've talked about this, how for Arendt, we all shield ourselves from reality, whether it's becoming part of movements, right? Like Nazis or communists or any other one, or whether it's becoming um, uh, uh, enamored with theories, you know, whether it's theory of uh, liberalism or conservatism or, or, or deconstruction or critical race theory or anti-critical race theory or new uh, neoliberalism, all of these theories insist that we look at the world through a predetermined uh, uh, you know, uh, setup, organization, and actually hide the reality of the world. It's from us. And we seek to turn the world into something that we can know and thus find the truth in, instead of encounter it 
in its fullness and thus make them and, the, and then in its meaningfulness. And that's, um, and that's what um, thinking here would, would entail. Uh, um, yeah. Is that, am I, am I, am I responding to your question in, in the way that shows that uh, I- Yes, I, th I think so. Um, um, I, 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 I don't think I'd go quite as far as you go. I mean, in that you're implying that to have any um, theoretical body that guides you to some extent, I think it's more your relationship to that body. If it's a critical engagement, um, uh, because there's no world in which you're not informed by some kind of uh, theoretical well, I, structure. I tried to say that. I agree with you on that. We're all, we all live in a world and we're all in some in meaningful ways molded by that world. And yet um, there's also ways in which we get caught up in, you know, I mean, those of us who are in the academy get caught up in intellectual movements, which are different from the world we live in, right? I mean, neoliberalism is an intellectual movement. It's not the world we live in. To say that we live in a neoliberal world, as some people would do, or that we live in a racist world, is to actually limit ourselves in our encounter with the world to only those parts that fit with our theory. That's what I think she's after. Um, yes, I, I don't think neoliberalism is an intellectual theory in that sense. When we use the term neoliberalism, it's usually coming from a critical account. Most people who discuss neoliberalism aren't proceeding from the notion that this is a great thing. It, 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 the, the term was almost invented as a critical engagement. Well, I think racism is similar. I mean, most people don't use the word racism thinking it's a great thing. Hmm. I think they all do. I think the, the point is that if you have a if you look at the world thinking that the world is neoliberal or the world is sure. capitalist sure. or the world is racist or the world is um, socialist, you're going to pick out those facts and pick out those events that fit your narrative and your theory. And you're not going to uh, engage with the fullness of the world. That's, and you're going to seek to make the world true and fit your theory and fit your whatever and not um, make the world meaningful not love the world as something beyond all these different theories. I think that's the, that's the force of, of what she's after here. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Or, or not. Leave it there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know Dina, I saw you next and now I see you left. Did you get off and come yeah, back? I'm sorry. Yes. I, I, I didn't want to. Why don't, you, why, don't you jump in? why don't you jump in okay. now? Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I know she says she isn't a philosopher and I know she says philosophy is over and metaphysics is dead. I know that uh, I agree the tradition has suffered a breakdown uh, in part because of the Holocaust but maybe some other reasons as well, which she um, identifies throughout her, her work. But to what extent is the exercise in this book uh, about thinking about thinking, which is what this book does, to what extent is that not an exercise in philosophy, however you'd like to uh, define it? Or in other words, to what extent is that not also part of this fractured tradition? Um, and to just support what I'm trying to get at from the introduction, from the reading, she does admit, right, that uh, Kant uh, got there but then didn't develop the distinction between Verstand and Vernunft. Later on, she'll tell us that Aristotle sort of mentioned it as well and then it was buried. And much of her work is oftentimes the excavation of that which was buried. But that doesn't necessarily make it less philosophical. Um, regardless of whether or not she considered herself a philosopher and really separate and apart from sort of the rather silly notion that only people in, uh, in um, academic settings can be philosophers. So if, even if we accept that, you know, um, 
um, she's not a philosopher, whatever. I mean, it, it's not so much about the definition of who or what is a philosopher, but rather whether the exercise of thinking about thinking doesn't have, isn't part of a certain tradition, a, a tradition that is critical of itself, um, and a tradition that Arendt is, for better or worse, fractured or not, part of. Mm -hmm. There's a part of me that wants to ask what's at stake in your question, but you know, I think if I understand it, what's at stake is do we keep Arendt in the tradition of philosophy? And then I would ask again, what's at stake in your question? What really matters? What? Does it matter if Arendt is a philosopher? Or if she, no. she's doing his philosophy? No, it doesn't matter. But what does matter is whether or not when we are thinking, we are always, um, always already um, bound to a tradition, even in the exercise of telling ourselves that it's fractured over. Yeah, I mean, that's an actually, you know, that's a really interesting point. And, it, you know, for those of us who've read it when we were doing Men in Dark Times and read the the essay on Walter Benjamin, um, you know, I think you could go back to that essay and, and think about, um, you know, what does it mean to do go pearl diving uh, and and dive into the tradition um, and pick out parts that are meaningful to you. And, you know, for, for Benjamin and Arendt, um, this kind of pearl diving where you dive into the tradition, you pick out this quote from Plato or this quote from Heidegger or this quote from Aristotle is, is not philosophy because it's not trying to be part of a, of, a, of, a, of a common discourse, but it is recognizing that there are, whether you're in art or literature or philosophy or whatever, there's great pearls to be had, which are inspirational and can, 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 be, can make us think and find meaning today. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, I think that's more in the tradition that she's coming from than as a philosopher. Um, you know, to some degree, this is not a question that I think it's enormously, I don't care if we call her a philosopher or not per se, as long as we recognize what she's doing. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't care whether we call her a philosopher either. I mean, that's completely irrelevant. What the, the the title or the name we give it but i just think we do need to be a little critical of her assertion that that's not what she's doing you know this very uh, um, over and over again she insists that god forbid or not or she doesn't refer to god but you know she's very insisting that, that that's you know not that's the last thing she would be doing and 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 i think we need to um think about what why that is why she's so insisting on that um when, she, when, when what she's doing is thinking about the relationship between thinking and meaning. And I don't, and, and is also acknowledging that that very much is part of the tradition, even though she thinks it wasn't, it was buried uh, for reasons that we learned uh, in the human condition. Um, so. No, I mean, the, the tradition of thinking about thinking is certainly a philosophical tradition. Um, and uh, in that sense, what she's doing is a philosophical project. And she says that. Uh, I think she just doesn't want it to be part of, she doesn't see that tradition as continuing and she doesn't see herself as caught in that tradition. Um, yeah. And so you, you're saying, should we be critical of her attempt to free herself from that tradition? And I think it's a good question. To what extent is she, I mean, so let's, you know, I, I'm, I'm engaged in some very interesting conversations about, you know, deco decolonizing the curriculum and things like that. To what extent, despite these claims about the end of tradition and the end of metaphysics, is Arendt still a Western metaphysical th thinker, right? right? I think that's a perfectly legitimate question to ask. And, you know, I think that the answer is not clear. I mean, I think in one way she is and in one way she's not. She's clearly trying to get out of it. Um, and yet, you know, there are habits and biases that she has that clearly keep her in it. And I think if that's the, if that's sort of the thrust of your question, I think you're absolutely right. We need to we need to think that I mean, it's actually a question about that exercise when we think about someone as to whether or not they're part of a tradition is that exercise of decolonizing part and not also part of a tradition or coming out of a tradition can we actually escape the tradition entirely even when we're trying to think about how to decolonize it that's what my I, question i think is. that's an excellent question um and uh 
you know, we'll, we'll keep thinking about it as we go forward. Um, I, you know, I think clearly she's trying to jump out of this. And, uh, you know, one of the things you should point out as we go through it is to the extent she succeeds or doesn't succeed. Um, okay. Right. Uh, um, thank you. Yes, thank you. Ken, Ken Landauer. Thanks. Um, this is not following Dina's question as much as I like, but I'm curious about how she's using the word knowing. Um, and partly I'm wondering more about the German. And I'm thinking about it in terms of, I don't know if this book has ever been translated into any Latin languages, but I know that there are two words for knowing. The one that's based on like conocer and one based on saber or saber or sapor, whatever it is. Um, and they're very different ways of knowing or understanding something. Um, the conocer I see more as like being familiar with something, like a person, which always implies some more depth that we can't explain, and or saber or sapor, whatever, knowing like facts or or more limited things. And, and it's a very different relationship to the world that comes about from those different words. It's not one we have in English that I can think of. I don't know what the, but I know like when she's using the word cognition, that's a similar root, um, which would be, I guess, becoming familiar with something. But anyway, I'm wondering about that, like the, how she's using the word knowing, if there's a sort of German, uh, more to say about the understanding and intellect there. Yeah, so, I mean, the word knowing, um, uh, which she here uh, uh, groups with the with the German Verstand or Verstehen, uh, which is something like our understanding, um, is going to then be connected with cognition, right? As you rightly said, um, uh, or you know, so that knowing is an attempt to uh, to understand something, to put it within, and then and to put it under rules. So, uh, you know, if you think of it in classical philosophy, it's to, you know, to have it under, uh, uh, so that the, the, there's a rule and then there's the instantiation of, of the rule um, in a logical uh, formula. Um, so, um, you know, we'll read a lot more about it uh, as, we, as we go along, but uh, that's the, the basic idea. Knowing is um, a cognition, an understanding that seeks to know something with certainty and um, find its truth. Uh, uh, and that's going to be opposed to uh, thinking, which seeks not truth, but um, meaning. Um, the word, I mean, the, ma the basic word is verstehen, uh, for, 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 for knowing, uh, well, understanding. Um, uh, there's other words um, that that can be used. Wissen or, or Wissenschaft is a complicated word uh, because, from Arendt's perspective, um, the German Wissenschaft, which is what we would translate as science, um, actually has a double meaning. Uh, it can mean both um, uh, knowing, as in the search for truth, but also Wissen in the search for Weisheit or or, or wisdom. Uh, a knowing in a more um, in a more uh, thinking or or meaning oriented way, and so um, it's one of the reasons she thinks that um, um, the social uh, that, that, that 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 the German word Wissenschaft has opened has been more open to the idea of the distinction between thinking and meaning than the English or Latin word science, because scientia, the Latin word science, doesn't hold open this idea of vis of vision, of knowing outside of a kind of knowing outside of cognition um, like Wissenschaft does. Um, and so uh, um, there's a way in which you can translate Wissenschaft as study, as, as, as sort of, or social sciences, so, Sozialwissenschaft as social studies rather than social science. And, um, and thus, uh, she thinks that's an important distinction. It's one of the reasons, for example, at Bard College, 
um, we don't actually have a program in social sciences. We have a program in the social studies. Uh, and that was named by her husband, Heinrich Blucher, uh, along those lines, um, because he wanted to avoid the idea of thinking about a science of man, because he thinks that man is beyond scientific knowledge. Man is meaningful, not knowledgeable. And, um, and so her husband named the social studies at Bard and to the chagrin of one of my social studies colleagues who would rather it be the social sciences. Um, but, uh, but so it goes. Um, we'll continue to talk about this for the rest of the book. Is that okay for now, Ken? Uh, Bob. Bob, are you here? There we go. There we go. Uh, at the risk of playing the mosquito, trying to take a bite out of a giant, I can't help but think of Heidegger when she talks at the bottom of the first paragraph, really, on page five about morality and thinking. So she says, could the activity of thinking as such be among the conditions that make men abstain from evil doing or even actually condition them against it? Well, Heidegger was a world-class cad. I mean, he was kind of in that camp before he actually became a card-carrying Nazi. You know, he was terrible in the way he treated um, Kassira in the, uh, the Davos exchange in the 20s. It's terrible the way he treated his teacher, fired his teacher Husserl because he was Jewish. He was a cad with respect to his wife and to Arendt and we tried to use after the Second World War. And, but yet he was this great thinker. So if he was such a profound and terrific thinker, why wasn't he protected against evil doing? So, um, you've, you know, Bob has, of course, raised the question of Heidegger, um, which could take a year for us to explore. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm in a position of if I, um, you know, I don't want to defend Heidegger against things he did, and I don't want to deny anything he did. Um, you know, he certainly, uh, you know, we can say he was a cad to many people. Uh, he certainly did not treat Karl Jaspers well. Um, uh, he didn't treat Husserl well. Uh, he didn't treat Kassira well. Uh, on his wife, it's a different question because she's the one who had the affairs first and they had their agreement. Um, uh, um, but uh, any, any, and, and one could argue it didn't treat Arendt well uh, in certain ways. Um, but, and he did join the Nazi party and he did become the rector of Freiburg and um, for about a year, uh, um, rule, you know, become, uh, work as a rector from 1932 to 33, I think. Um, None of this is defend Heidegger, but it is to say that he did resign. He did resign his post, or he was forced from his post because he refused to uh, uh, be ideologically pure uh, and do what the Nazis were asking him to do. Um, and he did then spend the rest of the war teaching privately, since he was disallowed from teaching officially, and teaching in ways that clearly um, uh, uh, were set against the Nazis and seeking to show the Nazis to be, um, uh, in his mind, uh, problematic. Now, none of this is to defend him and say he was a good person or that he didn't do bad things or that he didn't, or that he could have done more and didn't do it. He did, all of these are true. 
I'm not trying to get in here and say, you know, Berkowitz is defending Heidegger. Um, uh, but I do think we should at least be, um, I, think, I think that while he did some bad things, um, I, I don't think you can say he acted thoughtlessly and never uh, reflected on it and, and didn't, and just kept going on. I mean, I think that's clearly not the case. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, people bring up this question of, well, if thinking protects against evil, what about Heidegger? A lot in the Arendt world. And um, all I can say is I think Heidegger had his limits. Um, he was not a very courageous man. Let's start there. Uh, he was, Arendt's reading is that he was also arrogant enough at the beginning that he thought he could actually control the Nazis and move them towards his idea. And that after he realized he couldn't, that's when he was forced out. Again, I don't know whether you credit that reading or not. I mean, there's lots of different approaches. Um, uh, I think uh, Heidegger raises questions and Arendt will say that he's a thinker who got caught up with the power of his own thought and thought that he could, through his thinking, have more impact than he could. In a sense, she argues that Heidegger, for a short period, about a year, um, actually thought that thinking could be useful and thinking could be practically useful. And he engaged in the practical attempt to make thinking useful, join the Nazi party. And then in Arendt's reading, when he realized his mistake, he um, was forced into uh, private teaching and prohibited from teaching in public. Uh, my question isn't so much really about Heidegger. Yeah. I'm, I'm questioning the efficacy of thinking to protect us, correct us from evil doing, especially when in the previous paragraph, which I don't know entirely how to read, she's suggesting that maybe habits aren't the way to go. And I'm arguing that uh, maybe moral ha habits, whether it's a uh, catechism, whether it's the Torah or uh, Hammurabi code, whether uh, this is maybe a better uh, protection against falling into evil. Yeah. Good. I mean, again, I was just trying to use that as background. And I hope what I was trying to say is that in her reading, Heidegger eventually separates himself from the Nazis. Now, he never, he never formally withdraws from the party. And, you know, we can argue about what to make of that. But he clearly ceases to make himself useful to the Nazis after 1933, which is much earlier than most people. So one argument is that his thinking in some sense did protect him. If you don't agree with that, um, then we can talk about the faults in his thinking. Um, or you can say uh, she's wrong and that thinking doesn't protect us. I think it's a, it's a legitimate question to ask. Um, she, I mean, one thing I will say is that she does think that intellectuals, many intellectuals fell prey to Nazism. And what she says about those intellectuals is they didn't think. Um, they got caught up in theories. And it could be the Nazi theory, or it could even be the theory of, um, you know, uh, to try and, uh, if, if I get fired, someone else will do it. So I'll try and do the best I can, the lesser evil theory. And, and she says that intellectuals are extremely good at justifying their actions rationally and rationalizing their actions and doing evil and rationalizing them. And, um, and so she thinks that not all intellectuals think. In fact, most intellectuals or very many intellectuals in her mind don't think. Um, whether Heidegger is an intellectual who doesn't think or whether he is one who does think is, is one that we could we would have to do a lot more specifically arguing about Heidegger. I don't wanna get into that per se right now, but, um, but I, don't, I do think that we should be aware that intellectuals are not the kind of people she thinks that generally think. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I don't yeah. know that we're on the same page here. Well, what, what, I'll forget Heidegger. Where are we not on the same page outside of Heidegger? Uh, on this whole 
suggestion that thinking will uh, inoculate us hmm. against evil doing. Right. And that she's dismissing the uh, the value of habits. So, okay. So first of all, she doesn't dismiss the value of habits at all. She simply says we can't count on them anymore because they no longer exist. Um, she thinks that the tradition is broken and uh, it's not going to be rebuilt anytime soon. So you just have to accept that as a fact and simply trying to reteach the catechism is not going to be helpful from her point of view. Um, secondly, uh, so, I mean, yeah, she's not against tradition. She just doesn't think we have that option right now. On the question, which is a question, she says the question imposed itself, right? She doesn't have, I mean, I just want to be very clear. There's nowhere in her work that she answers this question. She thinks it's an important question. And if you disagree, if you, if you think the question is to be answered, no, that the activity of thinking as such can't protect us. By the way, I think that's a perfectly legitimate answer within our rents framework. That only opens another question is, can, how do we protect ourselves? And her view is going back to the catechism or going back to customs is not going to happen anytime soon because the customs and the tradition are broken. Um, so then we're left with the question of how do we protect ourselves? She's raising a question. Uh, I don't know what her answer to the question is. She never answers it. Um, in, a, in another essay called Thinking and Moral Considerations, you know, she says that generally thinking is useless and politically useless. And she then again raises the question about the, it might be that the only time thinking can be politically useful is in times of crises or catastrophe when everyone else gets carried away and the thinker can stop and think and separate themselves from the crowd. Um, so she does come to at least entertain this question of the usefulness of thinking in certain limit situations. Um, uh, I don't think she ever says that thinking will succeed in doing it, um, but she op opens the question of whether it might. And by teaching people to think and be independent and separate themselves from the crowd, can you teach them to at least keep themselves independent enough that they don't, they don't get caught up in movements, be it Nazism or communism or racism or whatever? That's, I think, the, the question she poses. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ahmed. Uh, yes. Um, my question, um, it sort of follows uh, David Bell's, um, who said maybe it doesn't matter if Eichmann really wasn't, you know, as thoughtless or as stupid as. Uh, he at least pretended to be in, in the trial. Um, so, uh, so my question is, is, is your uh, interpretation of that? Um, because I've also heard that um, he was sort of play acting that, you know, you know, he's only following rules and he's just a person who al always followed, you know, followed authority, et cetera. Um, if that's not the case, um, I, I think David assumed that it wouldn't matter if, if, if that was true. Um, but I'd like to hear your opinion on, what, well, what if it turns out, uh, what if it is true that he, he, he was um, uh, a passionate anti-Semite and he um, was a good play actor and so forth? Does, yeah, how much does that detract from, um, you know, um, the thesis at the beginning of this introduction or, um yeah or 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 would the idea that thinking could be um i guess a necessary but not sufficient condition of preventing the modern forms of evil uh still be um so be true so um uh you know the best book on eichmann if you want to learn about eichmann in a sort of really thoughtful way is Bettina Steinmetz's book, uh, Eichmann for Jerusalem or Eichmann before Jerusalem. And um, 
uh, she, in some sense, is um, the person who's most fully made the argument that Ahmed just talked about um, as part of her book, where she says that um, uh, uh, Eichmann, to uh, a certain extent, uh, in 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 Israel, is 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 playing the part of a sort of bureaucrat as part of his defense and uh, is not, and is much more of a ideological uh, thinker and anti-Semite than he gives off. Um, uh, so I think she's to some extent right. Um, and I think to a large extent, uh, and by the way, um, Nowhere in her book does she um, talk about Arendt's reading, right? I mean, she Arendt's mentioned a couple of times, mostly very positively. Um, I think largely Arendt agrees with that reading. I think the people who think Arendt disagrees with that reading are misreading or haven't read Arendt. Um, um, Arendt thinks that Eichmann um, uh, largely embraces um, uh, Nazism. Uh, and she's, uh, she, she certainly says we, that she doesn't credit his claim of not being an anti-Semite. Um, what she says is she doesn't think his anti-Semitism is the reason he did what he did, namely became a, a, a part of the genocide. Um, uh, and I think that's a different argument. Um, so, uh, then the question is, is, is Eichmann as Arendt argues, thoughtless, um, or might it be that he's actually um, a profoundly thoughtful uh, thinker who comes to the conclusion that the Jews need to be um, exterminated from the earth? Um, you can look at the evidence on, on all the sides and, and make your case. I mean, I certainly think that my reading of staying this book um, largely leads me to believe that he was not someone whose entire being is to exterminate the Jews from the earth, but was largely a um, thoughtless creature. Uh, not everyone who reads Stang this book agrees with me, so um, you can read it on your own. Um, uh, but I think she's largely, to my, my reading of Stang this book, largely uh, supports my reading of Arendt. I, Stang disagrees, but that's because she and I have a different reading of Arendt, not because we have a different reading of Eichmann. Um, the, the, the general question you're asking, Ahmed, which is to what extent that matters for this book, right, Life of the Mind, um, is good because it, 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 it does come down to um, if you think that Eichmann was someone who um, had a well thought out desire to get rid of the Jews and to elevate the Nazis to world domination um, and that that was what motivated him to act, then Arendt's reading of him as a thoughtless creature um, and uh, would be wrong and that he would actually be like uh, a Macbeth or, or a King Richard. He would be someone who um, was truly um, thoughtfully evil and uh, would be an example of, 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 of thoughtful evil uh, or ideological evil. Um, uh, and so I think that would be, if, if, if that were the case, um, that would uh, certainly question the banality of evil thesis. Uh, I don't think that's the case, and I don't think that Bettina Stangnitz's book proves that the case, although she may disagree with me on that, um, to be honest with you. So uh, uh, all I can say is you should read the book and, and think about it for yourself. Um, okay? Is that all right, Ahmed? Uh, yeah, I mean, the question is still r remains, um, yeah, can one be, uh, you know, thoughtfully evil? Um, um, of course, one can be or, thought, of course, one can be thoughtfully evil. I mean, um, you know, Hitler was thoughtfully evil, right? I mean, just to use, but there's many people who are thoughtfully evil. Arendt never, I mean, never says that there's no such thing as you know, people who are thoughtfully evil uh, or deeply evil. 
what she says is that things like the Holocaust can't happen without people who are not thoughtfully evil, um, who uh, do evil out of thoughtlessness um, for other reasons. Um, so that's a different claim than saying there are no people who are thoughtfully evil. I, I see where I see where you're going. Yeah, um, because the, you know the, the the whole massive apparatus uh, is not built on a large number of of, of thoughtfully evil people, but on um, a large number of people who just go along. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So for what her what her, her her argument is that modern bureaucratically executed evil depends upon the banality of evil, right? It's not that. You know, she she mentions people who are not banal, who are evil. She talks about them all the time. You know, there are people who are just evil. She just thinks they're, you know, they're they don't they don't motivate hundreds of people to, you know, thousands, millions of people to go and 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 kill innocent people on their behalf. You need the question is whether the people who work with the people who are thoughtfully evil are, you know, are are, are deep believers or whether they're largely thoughtless and. You know, her argument is that in the case of Eichmann, she thought he was someone who was thoughtless. Um, you know, whether she's right or wrong about Eichmann, whether she's wrong or right about most Germans or most people who did it at the time, not, not Germans, Nazis. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's the question that you're asking. I'll take that. I'll point out that there's a, a gentleman who's raising his hand physically Oh, um, but, that. but yeah, uh, Nolan, I think, and I think he said, I'm, I don't know where he would be in the queue, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't always see people who are raising their hand physically. I, uh, who is it? Nolan? Ah, uh, Nolan. Yes. In the future. I, in, and, uh, I can speak if I'm not out of line. Go ahead, Nolan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it would be interesting to me to know where or when you were introduced to Hannah Arendt. This book I happened to find about 10 years ago. It was written in 2000 and uh, about the year 2000, I believe. I had never heard of this uh, fine young lady, Hannah Arendt. I read the book and I became fascinated with her and read the origins. And in my reading, I have done a lot of reading in psychoanalytic literature, trying really to understand myself. And I'm amazed at how many instances in various readings of psychoanalytic literature, I see Arendt, Arendt, Arendt. She is referred to many, many times. And so I'm, I'm just fascinated with her abilities to write as she does. And last night in preparation for this, I thought I would look at the Eichmann Show, and this was produced by Leo Hurwitz, and he was working with Milton Frockman, and they were the ones responsible for televising the trial. And Leo was the director behind the four cameras and it was interesting that he was primarily thinking about it's too easy to write someone off as a one dimensional monster. And I got to thinking as I had read some of her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, that it could have easily been Hannah Arendt behind those cameras because she was trying to point out the humanness of this man, meaning that me, Nolan, could do the things that Eichmann did yeah. in the right circumstances. Thank and that you. applies to all of us. And so 
uh, I thank you very much uh, for your time. And to Roger, may I say, I have enjoyed immensely your presentation. I look forward to some more of them. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Nolan. So just a few things. First of all, um, the book, this book was actually, uh, um, well, I mean, Arendt died in, nine, in December of 1975, uh, uh, and she died while she was writing the book. So it was written largely between 71, 1970 and 75. Uh, uh, it was first published by Mary McCarthy in 1977, edited and published. Um, and uh, so I don't know which version you read in for published 2000, but but yes, it's 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 and it's and it's a great book. As I said earlier, it's not finished. Um, uh, the uh, there's a movie, a documentary by uh, uh, an, a man named Ayal Silvan, Ayal Silvan, um, uh, and it's called The Specialist. Uh, I'll type his name in the chat so you have it. Um, and it's uh, an edited version of the video from the trial um, that, that Nolan was talking about. Um, it's criticized by some people because they think that it's cut in such a way uh, to actually emphasize RN's points and make Eichmann seem like uh, a thoughtless creature. A thoughtless individual. Um, uh, so, you know, you should know that there's a controversy around that movie if you do decide to watch it. I think it's a, a very worthwhile movie to watch. I teach it regularly. Um, but uh, uh, you should know that it's been criticized for being, for use, it, you know, what it does is it does take some passages and repeat them a number of times and it cuts in certain ways. Um, and so people have said that it's 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 trying to prove a point. Um, and I think that's true. Um, whether or not it does prove the point is is is, is an open question. Um, but I think uh, uh, Nolan, you're right to 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 turn us to that and and uh, worth taking a look at, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, in general, if you want to raise your hand and speak, you can just go down to the bottom of your screen and there should be a button that's called reactions. And if you click on reactions, you can find that little raise hand button, Nolan. And in the future, you do that and you'll get in the queue and I don't want to have to look for you because I can't see everybody on my screen at once. Um, Liz, Liz R, you're next. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the text actually at the bottom of page 12. Um, there she's getting into the fact that it's an advantage, the death of metaphysics is an advantage but then she says, um, the advantage would have been even greater had it not been accompanied almost inevitably by a growing inability to move no matter on what level in the realm of the invisible. And I wasn't, I wasn't totally sure what she meant by the realm of the invisible there. If on the one hand, she's celebrating in some ways the death of metaphysics and the death of God, um, like, what is what is she really talking about and how has it fallen into dis disrepute right thanks liz and, I, and i'll just point out um i love all the questions but i also really particularly love textual questions so i want to thank liz for um and others you're not the only one but coming back to the text um so the invisible here um would be uh a number of things, but it's basically the super sensible. So to take one easy example, um, uh, justice. No one's ever seen justice, right? I mean, justice is an, is an idea, it's a concept. Or um, uh, Christian charity or um uh uh you know any any idea like that which are parts of a tradition you know christian charity for many for a thousand years meant things to people it was an invisible idea that 
that it, that encouraged people and told people how to act. Justice was an invisible idea that that inspired people. Um, what she's saying today is that um, these invisible uh, ideas um, uh, are are no longer uh, believed in. Uh, to the extent we talk about justice today, we talk about social justice, justice that we can count, right? We don't believe in justice as an absolute idea. Um, and, 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 you know, so we, we only care about, well, what the outcomes are increasingly. Um, uh, and so uh, what she says is that um, with the loss of metaphysics and the death of God and the loss of um, of, of generally thinking as that which brings us beyond um, the things of the world, um, uh, we, we lose uh, the ability to, to talk meaningfully about justice. You know, if, we were to, if I were to teach a course today at any college in this country, or pretty much almost anywhere, and I say, we're going to read Christian theories of justice and Jewish theories of justice and Islamic theories of justice and um, Greek theories of justice. And we're going to talk about which of these ideas of justice people be like, ah, oh, boring, right? I mean, you know, it's a, okay, story, if, I'm a, if, I'm a, if I'm a philosopher interested in history of philosophy, maybe. But if I'm interested in doing justice in the world, none of those things matter to me because I want to gauge in the world, right? Uh, at least many of my students do. Um, they're not interested in knowing what the Christian idea of justice is, except again, as a historical idea. Uh, and, and that's, and so what she's saying is anything that's not visible, tangible, or palpable has fallen into disrepute. Um, uh, and so as a result, even though we have the advantage that we can look at the world of thinking anew, um, many people don't want to, they're not, that's not where they're engaged. Uh, does that help? or not yeah it does i guess like that does throw me off a little bit because just earlier in our discussion we were talking about theory and and this idea of over -theor theorizing but is you is the idea then you would say that she regrets that theory doesn't exist just in and of itself as a thing to think about and that it's too linked to action no, I don't think she, I mean, she's not a fan of theories in general. Um, but, you know, when I say, okay, I, I, I see what you're, I, I said the Greek theory of justice or the Christian theory of justice. I mean, what she means is the Greek world or the Christian world. Um, and, but what she's, what, what I guess what she's saying is that these ideas um, are seen as empty ideas. Uh, they're not... Uh, they're not going to, I mean, there are some people still inspired by the American idea of justice, whatever that is. There are some people inspired maybe by Christian ideas of justice, but they're small groups. They're not, they're not, they're not going to, um, they're not ever going to again, um, this may be controversial, but they're never again going to uh, motivate um, uh, millions of people in a, in a collective action. I mean, that's RN's view. Um, and so people have largely moved away from this debate about what justice is uh, on a theoretical or, a, or an idealistic level, um, at least for now. Um, and, that's what, and that's what she's saying. So if we're going to, if we're going to do, if we're going to take advantage of our situation of the demise of metaphysics and look upon the past with new eyes uh, and um, be able to think anew about the past and the present. We have to think that these I, that, 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 that saying things about charity or justice or truth are meaningful. Um, and what she's saying is too many people today don't think so. They largely think these things are, um, are, uh, are waste are time wasters, um, and so they're they're not going to engage in it. Um, 
I mean, I leave aside the word theory and says, I mean, does that make sense just from a, I mean, do we, does everyone think that makes sense or, or they think that's wrong? I mean, you know, we talk about justice a lot, but we don't talk about what justice is, right? We talk about well, how to make the world more just as if we, you know, all know what it means is equal outcomes or something like that. Um, what Arendt is saying is we don't gauge in the, in the, in the, in the, in the discussion of justice as a idea, as an invisible idea, because in our active age, that's just not that important. What do you think, Liz? I think I need to give that a lot more thought. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yi Da. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Can, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, I have a question about um, uh, number page number nine to number 11 because ours talk about the, this idea of God is dead, the loss of uh, metaphysics. And uh, at page nine, second paragraph, the first sentence, she says, it was Nietzsche, not Hegel, who first declared that, that the sentiment underlying religion in the modern age is the sentiment that God is dead. And then she proceed to page 10. And here, the first paragraph in the middle sentence, it says that the way God had been sought for the thousand years is no longer convincing. If anything is dead, it can only be the traditional sort of God. So she's saying it's not God itself dead, but it's the traditional thoughts of God. So in the next paragraph, she says, uh, what has come to end is the basic distinction between sensory and the super sensory. So what is dead is not only the localization of such eternal truths, but also the distinction itself. So she's making this argument of, um, the elimination of the boundary between the sensory and the super sensory world. And she said, it is indeed true that once the super sensory realm is discarded, it's opposite the world of appearances as understood for so many centuries is also annihilated. So, I mean, and then she goes on quoting Heidegger's and Nietzsche's um, saying that elimination of the super sensory also elim eliminates the mere sensory, thereby the difference between them. So I, I was wondering like, if you can give any concrete example or is this like just, you know, argument? It's, it's a conceptual, it's, a, it's like, it's the, it's a, it's a not very, uh, is there any way we can think of these things in concrete term? Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. And in, in a sense, this is similar to Liz's question. Um, so just so you all can know, um, the, fir the first person to make this general argument that Yida is describing here, um, was Nietzsche uh, in his book, The uh, Twilight of the Idols. And Heidegger discusses it in volume one of his lectures on Nietzsche in 1935 or 4, 34, 35. Um, uh, and, and Arendt is here um, um, uh, relying on, on those two discussions in case you're, you're interested. Um, the, the basic, um, so in, in the Nietzsche, in the Twilight of the Idols, it's, there's a passage called How the Tr True World uh, Became an Error, uh, I believe is the some, in some of the English translation. Um, and uh, 
and 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 what he does is he shows how um in in i think seven stages six or seven stages um we went from plato who thought that the true world was or the ideal the true world was the ideas the super sensory right so for those who've, who've read a little plato the theory of ideas says that um the ideas are eternal and everlasting and thus truer than what is in the world which is fading so you know this book which you know has seen better days um is simply a a, a copy of the true book um and and the true book is 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 is, is sort of the idea of the book um and and that's and that's where the truth lies and so the truth lies in the super sensible and um you know then you had uh the christians and augustine and aquinas who says yes the truth lies in the super sensible but it has to be um the truth of god and then you have um positivists who begin to question that and, and say well actually or kant who says well yes the true world is the true world and yet um uh we can never know the true world so um we have to still live in this world that's the kantian uh, approach and then you get the positivists who say well actually no the true world is not not only not knowable it doesn't exist all that exists is the real world the world we have here um and so you know so the positives will say doesn't matter what the idea of justice is what matters is um you know that uh I have food and you have food and that that's justice or we all earn the same amount or here's, you know, that justice becomes a, a, a real thing in the world, not an idea. And, and Arendt's uh, view, which is what Nietzsche said, is, the, in, is that once you, once you abolish the true world, you also abolish the apparent world because the apparent world is understood in opposition to the true world. Um, uh, and so here, um, she's now saying it's the same in the other way as well. If you um, abolish the apparent world, you also abolish the, the true world. Um, so uh, what, are, what are a concrete, uh, um, a concrete manifestation of this? Uh, well, I mean, I just gave one in some sense on, uh, to when I was talking to Liz about the the idea of 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 judgment of justice um uh she offers one here from democritus right where democritus says um sense perceptions are illusions says the mind they change according to the conditions of our body um and then uh, these senses answer wretched mind you overthrow us while you take from us your evidence right the point is that if you if you if you lose if you don't have an idea of truth how can you have an idea of of appearance and vice versa um uh if you want to put it in 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 legal terms um i mean i i said this to liz before but if you don't have an idea of of justice um uh, it's very hard to say that we're concerned with justice in the apparent world. Um, you know, we can talk about me having more than you and you having more than me, but what is justice? And so you abolish the true world of justice. You also abolish the apparent world of justice. Um, uh, and I mean, I would imagine if we could come up with many more examples. Are those not the kind of examples you have in mind, Gida, or am I missing something? Well, she, I mean, on page number eleven, she said, in other the the first uh, the first not the second paragraph, almost the last this the second last sentence. She says, in other words, once always precarious balance between the two world is lost. So there is a balance between the two world, no matter whether the true world abolished the apparent ones or vice versa. The whole framework of reference in which our thinking was accustomed to orient itself break down. 
So she, yeah. she's she's more thinking of like um, the balance between the two worlds, not necessarily. The, so the argument the argument here is that in in the Western tradition, right? Which again, go back to Dina's question about decolonization. Is she caught up in the Western tradition? Possibly, very much possible. But she's arguing that in the Western tradition, almost all of metaphysics has assumed that there's a true world and an apparent world, or a super sensible world and a sensible world. And that this balance between the two, the fact that justice in the apparent world is supposed to be a copy of justice in the super sensible world. And that justice in the super sensible world, you know, relates to justice in the apparent world. And this is the way justice and truth and charity and piety and uh, humanity has been understood in the Western tradition. And that you can't just simply overthrow one and then still have the other. The, the whole way we understand the apparent world comes from its distinction from the true world and vice versa. So um, if you have the death of metaphysics and the death of the true world, it's also going to um, uh, change and abolish the apparent world. And then we have to, in a sense, remake uh, what the world is as not one that's divided between the true and apparent. And that's how difficult this is because we can't get out of this language. We always think about truth world and the apparent world. And so then on the next page, on 12, page 12, she says, well, one of the advantages of the death of metaphysics is to look at things anew, right? But, and then this goes to Liz's question, even when we look at things anew, we're stuck because we still think in the truth world and the apparent world, and yet we don't really know how to talk about the true world. And so we're still stuck in this old metaphysical discourse that no longer really we believe in, but still we can't escape. That's, um, that's what she's talking about here. Okay. Um, I see Rob put up his hand. We're out of time, Rob. So I'm going to have to run, uh, but maybe you can save your question for next week. Okay. Um, we have plenty of time to read this text. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing so with you. Thank you all very much. It's been a great first session. Uh, and enjoy reading Hannah Arendt, and we'll see you next week.